Hello everybody, it's Sanyo, engineer, MBA, and investor. And in today's video, we are in Atlanta here. I'm here for work. Uh, and I thought to myself, you know, let's make a video here in today's video and talk about what happened this week with CRISPR Therapeutics, specifically in the uh, city conference that they just had. Um, and of course, the CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics, known as Dr. Sam, made a couple of comments. And of course, Yair here in this Twitter thread made a couple of uh, notes there, and I think it'll be worth looking at it. Of course, there is a context behind it. We got to remember that Beam 201 is being put on hold by the FDA for numerous reasons. It is on hold, and of course, Beam Therapeutics using base editors has been put on hold. They're not doing double-stranded breaks. It's obviously not the first generation of CRISPR, but there is a context to be put here in the times we are currently living in. And of course, Yair pointed out that here's an interesting presentation of CRISPR Therapeutics, unique three-point business plan described by CRISPR Sam, of course, Dr. Sam here, City Conference. Number one, de-risking the platform. Number two, focusing on execution and marketing the product. And number three, diversifying CRISPR Therapeutics pipeline after initial success, right? So what is initial success? Of course, that is for CJ001 to get to the commercial side of things. We're expecting FDA submissions by the end of this year, within the next two months, I would assume. And of course, have this FDA approved from Q1 2023 so they can make some sales by Q2 or even Q3 2023. So that means mid-summer of next year, we'll be seeing some sales for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia therapy that CRISPR therapeutics offer through Hexacell or known as CTI-001. Now, let's talk about a couple of things, guys. Why it is important um, for CRISPR therapeutics to de-risk the platform, right? Let's take a look if uh, this is uh, mentioned here. Um, Nat Haruni mentioned uh, this de-risking sound like sticking to ex vivo and AAV to me. Actually, CRISPR Sam did refer to in vivo genome editing. I personally was very impressive. Press from his compre comprehensive and structured business plan for CRISPR therapeutics. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this type of conference. And of course, these conferences are just, you know, it's their duty. They go on these conferences, they remind their business plans and so on. But I think these will get a lot more important as we get closer to an FDA approval, right? Because now you have, right now, CRISPR Therapeutics CEO going on there talking about de-risking the platform. Now, what does de-risking the platform mean? De-risking the platform could mean different things, right? But again, it's all about initial success after initial success. Initial success is not going with base editors. It is not in vivo for CRISPR therapeutics. It's definitely not prime editors. It's not about getting multiple programs approved. That's not their initial success. Initial success is really focused on CTI-001 or Hexacell, get it FDA approved, get some sales going, have 40% of the profits because 60% go straight to vertex pockets. Again, it was a trade-off they decided to make, but that's initial success. After that, after that, you get into what we call this business plan that they're talking about. De-risking, focusing on execution, and marketing, and of course, diversifying. So de-risking really what this is, and of course they go in details here, and I would highly advise everybody to look at this thread from Yair here, who's been amazing in this community, doing amazing work for the genomic slash CRISPR space. But really, you know, I think de-risking and diversifying comes into, you know, hand to hand, right? Diversifying for CRISPR therapeutics doesn't just mean going for CTX110 for the CAR T-cells program or Viacite or now owned by Vertex program with type 1 diabetes or even their uh, heart disease program that they've released just recently, a few weeks ago. It's not just that, right? It's about the technology, right? We're talking about in vivo. We're talking about potential base editors. We're talking about different delivery methods with Hanruni, just Dr. Hanruni just mentioned previously that we took a look at. I think that's part of diversifying their product line, right? I think for these companies, you can't just look at programs and say, okay, well, they're having this program tackle this side of things, this disease for that program, and that's diversifying. No, diversifying means expanding your range of tools because in this age era we're in, it's really uncertain which tool, which CRISPR generation will really have the most commercial success in the upcoming three to five years. It's really uncertain. You can't say it's second generation of CRISPR. Base said, just look at what happened with Beam 201, right? Beam, 
Prime Medicine is not even a public company, you know, they're not even going anywhere there um, yet. But look at gener second generation of CRISPR, you know, you had, you know, this uh, Rafa Bio who just announced it was a patient a few weeks ago after delaying it for months, if not years. You have Editas who's completely a mess. You have NTLA who's trying to get a second program in consecutive that we're yet to get data in six days. I think it's going to be a huge success. They'll definitely regain that number one spot. But again, that's beside the point. There is no proven product yet. There is no proven technology yet. I mean, as much as we can sit here and say CRISPR is the future, first generation is here to stay, or second generation is here to stay, ultimately, there is zero dollar made in the commercial side of things directly from programmed with drugs or therapies sold as CRISPR tool. There's none, nothing. Not CRISPR therapeutics, not NTLA, not beam therapeutics, definitely not beam therapeutics with their current hold for beam 201. At least they get beam 101 going for them, but yet they get to those anyone. So what I'm getting at here is, you know, I love CRISPR therapeutics mentality. It's always been about focusing on priorities and the priorities for this company has always been CTX-01, get it FDA approved, get it manufactured over a thousand patients a year, get some sales going, and then start de-risking, diversifying, and of course, focus on execution and marketing. Now, the only thing I'll say, I don't know how much marketing you have to do. I'll be honest with you, I don't really, I don't really, that's not really my strength there. I don't know how much, how much marketing you have to do for such product. I would argue that I think the marketing will probably go through more retail investors, something similar to what Tesla investors did for the company of Tesla retail investors did for Tesla for the last three, four, five years, right? Tesla spends zero dollars on traditional invest and marketing. Yet, you know, the brand is so well known. I mean, I think the plan for CRISPR could be something similar where retail investors, communities, hospital, doctors, professionals support this technology, CRISPR Cas9, for example, ex vivo in this case, that it becomes something really that they can market. And I think the whole space here will sort of help marketing, right? Verve 101 with what they're doing with the heart diseases, beam therapeutics with, of course, base editors. You have prime medicine, mammoth, and the private market. So I don't, I'm not really worried about the marketing side, but of course, execution is important. Manufacturing is a different ball game. And you know, we saw many times CEO of Dr. Sam or even CEO Evans from Beam Therapeutics talk about the importance of manufacturing technology that are in the robotics, automation, because once the ball gets going, guys, it will get going, right? It's going to be very, very hard for these companies to slow down. It's going to be very, very hard. To, if, if you don't have the fundamentals right, you know, it's going to be very hard to unwind things up. And I think this is what Chris Petrobitics is focusing on. I love this type of conference high level because it reminds you that this company has a plan after CGI 001. And the way they reach the plan, of course, is by doing exactly what they did for CTX 001, but in a different format, right? With different programs different tools, but now you let the success compound for you. So I'll end this video like this, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I am in my hotel room. I got to head off here and start uh, doing some work there off, uh, off this hotel room in wherever we're located uh, this week in Atlanta. Uh, rainy day in Atlanta. Hopefully wherever you are, you're getting a better, better, better day than I am because it's definitely rainy, cloudy. Um, We'll see how Atlanta goes. I'll give you guys my feedback there. Uh, so far, so good. I mean, I'm not too impressed. I thought downtown Atlanta would be a lot bigger. Definitely not a lot bigger. Definitely smaller in Montreal. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. It is smaller in Montreal. I don't know if anybody, if anybody watching this video has been to Atlanta, um, but I think you, I might get some similar response because uh, I'm a little bit disappointed by the size of Atlanta, considering how much GDP is coming out of this city in US. But I'll end this video like this. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Do like this video if not. Subscribe if you're not. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a beautiful, beautiful Saturday. Thank you.